33-21 Colorado Falls in its regular season finale and its 2018 season finale here at Memorial Stadium in Berkeley. Five turnovers in the first half. You're just not going to win football games when that's when that happens no and <laughs> funny thing is they could have won a football game like that because that cal offense is just not very very strong this year i mean barely over 200 yards of offense and they win this game with 33 points so even with the five turnovers uh carl still had a chance but man you gotta look back at that and say <laughs> if you have three turnovers instead of five uh you know maybe they win this football game but yeah the, you come out the game right out of the gates and pick six and then three plays later another pick six you're down 14 nothing before cal's offense even touches the ball yeah, it's hard to win, win like that anywhere, but especially on the road. There's a lot of head-scratching things with this 2018 season, things that just are hard, hard to put into words. One thing I felt like the staff was really stubborn about was putting Ronnie Blackman at punt returner. I know he broke a couple this year, but it was a flat-out adventure every time that guy was back there. Why did yeah. he keep that job? I don't know, and I hate I hate ripping on one kid, you right. know. And but I mean that was we go back to the CSU game. I remember asking Mike McIntyre after the CSU game, you know, hey, you know, do you have to have a talk with Ronnie about fielding some of those punts that way? And he said, yeah, we'll fix that. Two or three games later, do you have to have a talk with Ronnie again? Yeah, we need to have a talk like that. And he kept the job. And you know, th- yes, there was a couple big plays. And you know, I know I think his punt return yards end up being like the most in a decade CU's had. But uh, man, the adventures back there were just insane. And, you know, they continued tonight. I mean, they continued from game one to game 12. And it certainly it's this season's not on him, but that was oh, one yeah. of those yeah. things that, you know, from, from game one to game 12, it's like, why is there not a change made there? And, you know, you and I talked about it going back to the off season that, you know, for the first several years of Mike McIntyre's tenure here, his punt returner was guys like, uh, you know, Nelson Spruce and Jay McIntyre mm-hmm. that weren't flashy guys, but they would catch the ball and just possess it and get the ball to the offense. And, you know, they might get five, seven yards on a return, which will help you. Yeah. But this year they just wouldn't do that. And, and you know, Jay, we've talked about it before, but Jay had the one bad game two years ago and just never really got that, that job back. And I, I don't really understand why. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to pick on him either. And, and this team not going to a bowl game is not on Ronnie Blackman. Yeah. At some point that's on the coaches because he had shown he's really inconsistent. It's not like yeah. he's not – trying back there so yeah. at some point you think they would have made a change uh, a couple other plays stood out to me in this game when they were trying to mount a comeback uh, to overcome those early turnovers the Drew Lewis late hit out of bounds mm-hmm. you just can't do that it's third and goal and, yeah. and we like Drew Lewis a lot he's been a stand-up kid throughout his whole career here he just he, he I give him credit he just we just I just t- chatted with him back in there and he talked about that play and you know you can finish your thought but yeah, yeah. a stand-up kid again you know after this game he owned up to it and and uh, and talked about hey because I asked him, I said, those are the type of plays all season. They're all throughout this losing streak you guys kept having. You know, Aaron Maddox's play a couple weeks ago, you know, he makes the third down stop and gets a taunting penalty. Uh, you know, things like that. Just throughout this losing streak, they, you know, maybe they happen to other teams and we're, and they're just highlighted because of the losing streak. But, man, there was a lot of them. A lot of discipline type plays that you don't see winning football teams make. And Colorado's probably not going to come back to win the game at this point. But Alex Fontenot clearly gets a hand on a punt. Yeah. And they call it roughing the punter. <laughs> What's going on there? Yeah, it, yeah, Colorado made its own made its own mistakes tonight, but uh, boy, they didn't get any breaks at all tonight either. And just uh, you know, that was Alex Fondo got his hand on a couple of punts uh, late in this year, mm-hmm. uh, and you know did a good job there. But you know, yeah, I thought it's the other, the other fisher. You could hear the mic. They hadn't they hadn't turned their mics off. The other fisher comes in and says, "I heard I heard him get a hand on it," and the other one says, "No." Nah, yeah, so it was not a lot of breaks for Colorado. The trajectory of the ball clearly changed <laughs> when it hit his hand. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to put into words what we've witnessed here. We had a hard time talking about the Oregon State debacle. And to, to sit here now, and Colorado is one of two programs in FBS history, I believe. You did the research on this to start out 5-0 and and not gain bowl eligibility. Yeah, uh, at least Power 5 history. I didn't go through and do all the like Mac schools okay. and all that uh, because some of those will be – you know, six and six and not make a bowl, but um, yeah, Power Five programs since 1997, the first year that they ever uh, reached 20 bowls, now they're up to like 39. Yeah. <laughs> but the first time they ever got to 20 back in 97, this team and the 2009 Kansas team are the only ones to ever start 5-0 and, oh and finish 5-7, and seven, which is 
insane. You know, and that Kansas team obviously was 5-0 and lose their first game in Boulder. You know, Tyler Hansen, <laughs> you know, goes out and leads the victory. Uh, but, yeah, for this team to be sitting here 5-7, and it's just stunning. And talking to a couple of players in the locker room, I asked them, uh, you know, I said, did you guys ever get over Oregon State? And a couple of them just kind of said, you know, I don't think so. And, you know, they, they said... And they kind of said it like, you know, now that you, now that you, now that I think about it, probably not, you know. And I think that that loss. I mean, we mentioned right after that game. Let's just never talk about that game again. But it it became the really the theme of this season was that Oregon State game. And you know, ultimately, you have to wonder did did those two quarters change the course of this season and of this football program? In 20 years, when we talk about the 2018 season with anybody, they're going to go, oh yeah, the Oregon State year. They, yeah. It definitely defined this football season without question. It did. And just like, you know, the 2010 season is defined by the Kansas game, yeah. which was a, a very similar collapse. I'll never forget that game, uh, quite a collapse, and I'll never forget that Oregon State game. And, and yeah, they had four games after that, but um, I don't think they ever got over that Oregon State game. And, I mean, it's just amazing that they were really about 28 minutes or whatever of game time away from clinching bowl eligibility, and they're not going to a bowl game. And if they win that, I don't think they – lose the, the the next four games after that no, do you? I, I think that i think they i think they go down to tucson and win the next week and i think they've got a shot to win here i think that that this is a seven and five eight and four eight and four football team if they win that game uh, against oregon state and we're talking about you know uh, we might have a cool story uh steven montez going home to the sun bowl later on this month but instead you know not a cool story <laughs> yeah <laughs> talking about a new head coach <laughs> One of the bright spots tonight was the fact that LaVisca Chenault and Trayvon McMillan both reached 1,000 yards, obviously McMillan rushing, Chenault receiving. The first time in program history, it's kind of hard to believe that that's the case that they've had, a rushing, receiving, 1,000-yard duo. Yeah, and you think of all, all the good players they've had, and you think, well, couldn't they have done it with this guy and this guy? But yeah. you know, the fact that it's never happened in, in one year is pretty amazing because they've had some pretty good rushers and good receivers. But to have it to have it go in a season like this is a little bit hollow. But uh, you know, I you, know, you got to give a lot of credit to Trayvon McMillan. He came in here as a grad transfer, and uh, you know, we talked about him after the game. Uh, he kind of did what he wanted to individually this season and came in and gave this run game a lift throughout the season. And Lavisca Chenault, just a sophomore, uh, the sky's the limit for him. And you know. A thousand yards and really nine games played, eight and a half games played. That's, yeah. uh, I mean, he was on pace for probably a 15, 1600 yard season. And so uh, for him, I think, I think bigger things are in store next year. And uh, Buff fans should be excited about him. And Chanel, who's always really quiet around the media, at least did admit when asked about his health recently that I was healthy enough to play. Read between the lines, he was yeah. clearly not 100%. And other teams were keen on him, in on him at that point. And uh, so you got to give him a lot of credit for battling back from that. It sounds, it sounds like they're going to have to do some work on that too, toe too going into this off season. Yeah, you think about it. You know, finishes with 11 touchdowns, which is pretty good for a season. But uh, you know, 10 of them were during that five-game uh, winning streak to start the season. Uh, it's it's crazy to think he hasn't touched the end zone since that 49-yard Wildcat run against USC. And uh, you know, he he was not playing healthy. He looked for the most part okay. But certainly not 100. percent But they're going to have to fix that uh, going into the offseason. That'll be you know one of the top priorities. Obviously, the top priority is get a new coach. <laughs> but then you know one of the other ones going into the spring ball is get him healthy. Speaking of that top priority, we don't have a bowl game to prepare for, so it's jumping right into the rumor mill, Brian. Yeah. Uh, we've been asked a lot about yeah. what, why are there not more updates. Well, part of it's because this team is preparing for this game and. and the other part of it is Rick George is playing this really close to the vest, and uh, it's a little bit different than the former AD, where you have all these leaks coming out seemingly almost every day. Yeah, and you know, you, you go back to Rick George's uh, press conference the other day when he announced the firing, and you know, he kind of he says, "Hey, don't follow where I'm where, where I'm traveling, things like that." I mean, he was putting it out there, "Leave me alone, basically. I want to do this thing quietly." And uh, I mean, he knows he knows this game. He's a smart guy. There are coaches, uh, you know. You and I were talking about earlier, a guy like Dino Babers at Syracuse um, has not taken jobs because things leaked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, I'm sure he's not the only one out there. I mean, guys don't like some that type of thing to be leaked. And so he's got to play it close to the vest. And if you want to get the right guy, uh, sometimes you got to play it close to the vest. And I know it frustrates fans. It frustrates us sometimes that there's not more information. But uh, when a guy's playing it like that, like Rick George uh, clearly intends to, there may not be a whole lot of information until there's an announcement that, hey, we're hiring this guy. We've been talking on this trip out to Berkeley. I think at the top of our list, based on the names that are being thrown around, are 
pretty similar, and it starts yeah. with a guy that's calling the plays there at Ohio State that just put up 62 <laughs> points against Michigan today. Yeah, it looked really good against a, a really good defense against uh, Michigan and uh, one of the better defensive coordinators in the country. Don Brown, um, yeah, 62 points against him. Ryan Day, uh, I think, is a guy that, uh, you know, I look at it, he's, he's near the top of my list. And, you know, I think that I think we're going to see Rick George go for a guy that's got Power 5 experience. You know, an initial list when you put it out last Sunday includes guys like Matt Wells of Utah State, Brian Harson of Boise State, good coaches. Uh, but I think that I think we're going to see Rick George go for guys that have Power Five and elite Power Five uh, pedigree. And Ryan Day is one that uh, he's had a lot of success at Ohio State. He's one that Ohio State's talked about. Is he the next guy when Urban retires, which could be this off season? And so uh, Ryan Day, I'd put near the top of my list. The thing that scares you about Matt Wells is the fact that David Yost is the offense coordinator there and is the main reason they rank second in the country in, in scoring offense. So you don't want to get in a situation like you did with Dan Hawkins coming here where the mastermind either doesn't come or even if Yost comes, there's no guarantee he's going to stay in Boulder. Yeah, I talked to someone this week that um, kind of knows the climate out in, in the with those Utah schools and said, hey, Utah State would love if somebody would take Matt Wells off their hands as long as they don't uh, take Yost. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I think you've you got to be scared about somebody like that um, are you running into that same type of situation but uh, you know there's some good group of five coaches out there I think Brian Harson is a, is a fantastic coach and with him it's you know I mean he was born in Boise he went to Boise State does he want to leave uh, you know that's one where he can make a lot more money here but is he comfortable there does he want to keep his family in Boise and does he love it there so um, you know we were talking on the way over here I think both of us agree our top choice if we're going to go group of five uh, would be uh, Seth Luttrell uh, of North Texas yeah. and that's a guy that you know, head coaching wise his, his experience is at North Texas but um, I believe he went to Oklahoma uh, you know and has power five experience so he knows big time football Another name that has been thrown around that I like a lot is Jimmy Lake, Mm -hmm. defensive coordinator at Washington. He told a radio station out in Seattle on Friday that I have a house here. I love it here. I plan to be here for many more years. Uh, If I had a dollar for every coach that said something along those lines and ended up going somewhere else, I'd be a rich man. So I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock into that. But it's going to take a lot to pull him uh, away from Seattle. It is, but you know, I think that Chris Peterson's one also that uh, you know, if there's a head coaching opportunity for one of his assistants, the thing is, I was up at Washington for, during basketball season uh, this last year. I had to make the trip for Pat Rooney and talking to their beat writers there, and uh, they had just moved. They had just made some changes on their coaching staff to where Jimmy Lake, uh, their co-defense coordinator, kind of stepped aside so that Jimmy could be the one calling plays. And one of the big moves for that is because Chris Peterson is setting up guys like Jimmy to be a head coach someday. And that's why those moves are made, to put them in position for that. So um, Chris Peterson sees that potential in, in Jimmy Lake, and, and you know, I think he's, he's trying to help him get a, a head coaching job. So I think he'd be a great, a great hire. I love his attitude. He's one also that it, uh, you know, I've heard you know, when he recruits defensive backs, he says, we're not even going to look at you if you're not an NFL talent. You know, and you know, they can be selective like that because they've been sending guys to the NFL. I like his attitude, and if you want a defensive mind, I think that, uh, that he'd be probably the best one out there. Where does Lane Kiffin fall on your wish list? <laughs> um, uh, right below, well, right above Dan Hawkins, I guess. Lane Kiffin is a hard no for me. Uh, I've seen his name, and there was somebody that threw out on Twitter earlier today that Colorado is going to interview you know Ryan Day and and uh, and Lane Kiffin and yay for Ryan Day, but no for Lane Kiffin. I, I have no idea why anybody would would want Lane Kiffin here in Colorado. I mean, he's had four head coaching jobs. He's been fired from two of them. He hasn't been a success in any of them, and uh, he's been a distraction everywhere he's gone. I don't understand. Uh, I mean, there's people talk about him doing things illegally and, and yeah. just yeah you know, i don't understand why he would wa- why any cu fan would want him here I, I wouldn't want him anywhere near this program it sounds like rick george wants a younger guy so it's not this they're probably not going to go this route but i would rather have a jeff tedford in here yes. any day over mm-hmm. a lane kiffin type any other closing thoughts here uh, on the coaching search before we wrap up here well i think those are kind of the the main guys that uh, you know we've talked about is probably on our wish list if you're going to look at you know, another one we were talking. Uh, another group we were talking about on the drive over here today was uh, how about sitting group of five coaches? And uh, you know, Dino Babers is one at Syracuse. I know a lot of people you know are looking at him. Uh, I think Syracuse is probably going to come up with some money to keep him, uh, so or, so, think, or somebody else will make a run at him, or somebody else will make a run at him. And you know, I think he might be a good fit here as well. He's got the ties to Hawaii. You could open up that recruiting pipeline again. Uh, you know, Dana Holgerson's name gets thrown out around a lot. 
I personally think that that's probably thrown out by an agent in a way to get Dana some more money in West Virginia, but we'll see. I don't, I don't see that one happening, but um, Derek Mason at Vanderbilt is one that I've thought of that, you know, maybe I know it's Vanderbilt and it's not like they're, you know, winning SEC titles, but that's a tough place to win. Uh, so the existing power five coaches, I don't know if that's actually going to happen, but um, you know, there's a couple names there. All right, it is officially the silly season. Uh, Colorado not going to a bowl game. It's been the silly season for about seven weeks. Very true, very (laughs) true. A different different silly season is uh, is what we're going to be embarking on here as we try to cover this coaching search as best we can.